Thank you. I'm delighted to be asked to come to talk to you today. And I've entitled um, what I'm going to talk to you about, Finding a Forever Family. That's a phrase that we often use when we're preparing children for uh, the idea adoption because as you'll hear the children who are adopted now in the north of Ireland and in the rest of the UK tend to be different sort of children than perhaps used to be in years gone by. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the rest of the UK, more specifically about Northern Ireland because that's where I work. I'm based in Belfast and that's where I've worked as a social work practitioner for the last 30 years. And as uh, Dr. Shannon was saying and, and uh, Professor Powell, I'm going to be particularly talking about pra the current practice and challenges to practice in Northern Ireland. So this is very much about practice. This isn't a legal presentation. Sadly, our adoption legislation in the North is still hopelessly out of date. 1987, I was going to say 25 years, of course it's 26 years now. Um, and, and there are lots of uh, struggles with that, and I think uh, Fergus is going to talk a little bit about that later on as well in his, in his presentation. But I suppose the difference really in uh, adoption post-1987 and before that is that now the focus really very much from that time on is about child-centered adoption. So the 1987 order was about providing opportunities for older children to be placed for adoption, not just consented babies. Um, there's been a lot of innovative practice, and I'll talk a bit about that later on, about hard-to-place children, children who in the past would have been stamped on their file unadoptable. No longer is it the case that finding a home for a child, it's, it's now the case that finding a home for a child is the focus, not simply adoption as a solution for infertile couples. The child has to be central. I think adoption, modern adoption if you like, has also grown out of a number of studies about children languishing in foster care. Children who were in foster care in the UK for many years without any sense of legal stability or permanence. There have also been a growing number of inter-country adoptions, as uh, Geoffrey was describing in your jurisdiction as well. However, it's the case that in the last few years in the north of Ireland, those have dramatically tailed off. And that, I think, is for a lot of reasons, including, obviously, the sending countries have changed a lot of their... Um, requirements really of who, who is suitable and also are attempting, some of the Eastern European countries particularly, are attempting to set up their own fostering and adoption services. And in general there's been a movement towards a lot greater openness and towards post-adoption contact and I'll be talking about that a little bit later on. So adoption, even though our legislation is, is rather old, adoption now is very different than it was a number of years ago. I suppose a question to be asked at the beginning of this evening is really why adoption? And I suppose what do we know? Well, we know that most research studies suggest that children who are adopted do achieve good outcomes later in life and feel a greater sense of fami family belonging and the security of that forever family. So there's that sense of legal stability, but even a child who's too young at the age they're adopted to really get that concept it's still seen that they can sense that this is important, this is my family now. <coughs> Excuse me. We also know that the younger the child when placed, the less likelihood of the adoption disrupting. So some, so, some uh, studies that may look a little alarming in terms of adoption breakdowns from the UK really are looking at adoptions of of different children, of children of large sibling groups who may all be adopted together, for example, or children who really have been so damaged by very many years um, of, of, of adversity, trauma and neglect that sadly they're not able to fully commit to being a member of their new family. So we know that early planning is very important. We also know that adoption by existing carers tends to be the most secure form of adoption. And of course there are lots of reasons why that would be the case, particularly because if the child's going to be adopted by foster carers who've looked after them for a number of years, they already have that established relationship and the foster carers know exactly what they're letting themselves in for. And I've just cited there three studies in recent times, but of course there are uh, numerous others as well. 
So who are the children in, in Northern Ireland? And then I'll compare with the rest of the UK. So last year, looked after children in Northern Ireland totaled 2,500. Uh, and 11. And that figure has remained reasonably similar around about the 2,500 for the last four or five years anyway. And the number of children adopted from care is 56. So we're really not talking about adoption as an option for huge numbers of children. And I think, you know, sometimes there's that anxiety around and obviously parents are concerned if their child's removed that there's this kind of threat of adoption. But the reality is adoption is a very good choice for a small number of children. So how do we compare with the rest of the UK? Well, there are the figures that you can have a look at. England, the first figure is the number of children who are looked after, and the, the, then in brackets, the number of children adopted from care. I suppose what's quite interesting is that Scotland, you would imagine, should have more children adopted from care. I won't begin this evening to talk about Scottish children's legislation. It's very complicated, and I don't know a great deal about it. Uh, so I suppose Wales would be the country that perhaps has the most, almost, I think you'll know, show you your statistics in a moment, um, and, and they had two, 246 children adopted from care. So again, you know, we're not talking about this as an option for huge numbers of children. These are the statistics that I could get for your own um, children. I expect someone will correct me later on. However, um, the, in, they're not from the same year, of course. So 2011, there were 6,160 children in care. And that's the statistic I got, Geoffrey, for, for non-family adoptions was 35. So I would presume that includes babies or children given up for adoption as well as those few children who would be uh, involuntarily adopted. Um, so, so I guess if you're going to, to um, think about who might this be relevant for, you, you maybe want to start thinking about what those numbers might look like um, for your, your looked-after population. So, uh, as uh, you'll see at the bottom of this, ARIS, the Adoption Regional Information System, um, this has been in existence now since 2010 in, in Northern Ireland, and the purpose of that is to collect statistics on children available for adoption and ad approved adopters, and also to link children um, with adopters who they may not otherwise have, have been linked with, so from different trusts, from different local authorities. So it's very useful because at the click of a button I can find out instantly how many children are actually currently waiting for an adoption placement in Northern Ireland. So the last time we looked in detail at the statistics for a, a report were, was the end of uh, last year. And at that stage there were 21 children. So that means there were 21 children where it had been decided that adoption is in their best interests. But at that particular moment there was not a family who was immediately identified who, who they could be adopted with. I'll talk a little bit more about the process later on. So within that 21 children there are five sibling groups of two. Now what we know is that all of those children will have siblings, and sadly, um, most children are separated from siblings when they come into care, and sadly, most children remain separated from some or all of their siblings. And what tends to happen is that we may get an inquiry, um, have you any adopters who could take four children who are all in one family? And what we know straight away is we have no one who's, who's approved to adopt four children together. That's not to say some people haven't done it, but it's not very common. Uh, interestingly as well, quite a change around in the last few years. Of the 21 children, three of those children are from a black and, or minority ethnic background or, or a mixed uh, Northern Irish white with a parent from a BME black background. That's been quite a challenge, and we know that we don't have adopters who are going to meet the ethnicity of a lot of the children who are now coming before the courts and who may require adoption at some stage, and I guess that that will be a challenge for yourselves as well. The age range of the 21 children waiting is five months, uh, up to seven years. That may be surprising. You think, gosh, you know, five months, that's a baby. That will be a child with significant particular needs. 
um, and no one is available currently who quite matches what that child needs. Um, seven years at the moment, that's the oldest child uh, who's waiting. The oldest child who we've had since the register was set up in 2010, I think, was nine. She wasn't placed for adoption. There were some people who may have been interested, but actually at that stage it was decided that the time, the window of opportunity for her had really passed. So the average age that a child is actually adopted, so the ad adoption order is granted, the average age is four years and eight months. Which is sad when you look at the age range of these children from five months to seven years. Happily though, a lot of those children will be placed with people who will go on to adopt them at an earlier stage, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So you've got to be a little bit careful comparing statistics, because if you look at the statistics on our um, uh, BAF website for the other UK countries, they're talking about the time of placement being at a different time, so it is quite complicated really. However, that's what we know, that, that children tend to be, and that, that statistic has only changed um, four years, eight months. It may have gone a month either way, but it hasn't changed largely since at least the last three or four years. I mentioned at the beginning about hard, harder to place children. Not surprisingly, uh, these tend to be older children, siblings. Interestingly, boys. We found when we analysed the placements and the children who hadn't found a placement for adoption after the first year of operating the regional system, that boys certainly tended to wait longer before they were adopted. And quite interestingly, that has been the same um, in the, certainly the uh, adoption register for England and Wales would have found that would be the same thing. Black and minority ethnic children, again, and I'll mention that later on, um, those children tend to wait longer as well, which is very interesting when you consider there are quite a few people who are approved to adopt children from other countries, from other ethnicities, um, on an inter-country basis, and yet for some reason some of those people um, haven't come forward to adopt domestically. Again, sadly, children who are known to have been sexually abused um, find it harder to find placements. Quite understandable that that's a, a big ask of new parents. Most of the children, most of those 21 children, will have some element of uncertain developmental delay. And that's difficult as well, because while we want to place children early, it's very difficult for adopters to take on children when they're not really sure what the prognosis is for that child's development. And most adopters, really at the very early stage, will say they prefer not to have a child placed with them where there's any uh, autism, anything on the autistic spectrum, and certainly fetal alcohol syndrome as well. So those are the children who are harder to place, and, and those are the children who wait. So who are the adopters? Well, we're unique in the, rest, in the UK in that we have more families available to adopt than we have children for adoption. The difficulty is, as you'll see later on, they don't sadly match. So at the moment, uh, the same date that we uh, got the statistics on the children, there were 43 approved families available. So 21 children, 43 families. Sounds straightforward, but sadly not. Interestingly, um, the, the Department of Health were particularly uh, keen to know about the age range of approved adopters, and they, they keep saying that they're surprised, but um, it's interesting actually. Most are over 40, and the majority are aged 36 to 50. There's no legal upper age limit uh, for adopters in Northern Ireland, but the general rule of thumb is that you would like the child to have been possibly the biological child by age of, of at least one of the, the, uh, the parents. At the moment, we have one single adopter um, and one same-sex couple. Um, it's complicated. I think uh, Fergus is going to talk about the law later on. At the moment in Northern Ireland, um, same-sex couples can apply and be assessed to adopt, but only one can actually legally adopt the child. 
Um, there's been a judicial review that Fergus is going to talk about, um, and he'll also mention the, the civil partnership. But at the moment, there is an anomaly um, in the law in that if you're in a civil partnership, then you actually can't adopt either as a couple or, or as a single adopter. But it's a, it's a changing scene, as you'll hear later on. Okay, uh, so how do children come to be placed for adoption in Northern Ireland? Well, we do still have a very small number of children, uh, of babies usually, or young children, um, where, where the, there is consent. So, as when I began my social work career, it was commonplace. Now it's not commonplace, but it's still possible. We sometimes get inquiries from um, women who find themselves pregnant and are thinking about adoption um, for their child. But it isn't. It isn't very common. I would, I would think that statistically there might be one or two a year. There are also, though, children who are removed from their parents. Um, adoption is then discussed. Um, and occasionally, some of those parents, particularly if the child's going to stay with a family who the, the birth family know and trust as foster carers, um, sometimes those parents will consent at a later stage to the child being adopted, that they will um, appreciate that, sadly, they can't look after their child and perhaps adoption is best for them. And that's obviously a very brave and difficult decision that a very few parents make. There are also concurrent placements, um, again, only a small number, and, and concurrent placement is really where the child is placed, at a, the baby really, a young child, or always really a child under two, would be placed with a family before, soon, as soon after birth as possible really, um, with a family who can either provide a foster placement for that child or will adopt the child. Um, there's a scheme that the Family Care Society are running in, Northern, in Belfast with Belfast Trust, and it's called Unite. Um, you can Google it, you'll find a lot of information about it. And they've recruited people specifically for this. Um, so what happens is there is still the possibility that that uh, young child may return home, but the children are selected on the basis that it's pretty unlikely. So, for example, maybe the fourth or fifth child of a mother who has failed hopelessly to conquer problems of perhaps drug or alcohol addiction, um, those are the sort of children. So there'd be a very small number, but those placements are wonderful because, as we know, the younger the child's placed with their forever family, then the better the outcome. So most children, um, certainly up until the last few years, who are placed for adoption would be going through the court system, so a care order would be granted, the plan would be adoption, and then there's another application to court for a freeing order. And that order then, the court is saying, yes, this child um, shall be available for adoption, and the birth parents, therefore, their rights are removed at that point, and that child would then have been moved from the foster placement to an adoptive family. However, bearing in mind that we know the earlier a child's place, the better it is for everyone, there's now really a big movement to place children with these dual approved foster carers who are also approved to adopt. So these are people who um, are approved as foster carers and adopters within uh, uh, in the same time frame. Um, so it's not something they've thought about later on, it's what they wanted to do from the very beginning. But they're prepared to take a child before that freeing order, so there isn't any legal certainty at that stage that the child will definitely be adopted, but the plan is definite that the child will not be returning home, as much as it can be, given that, of course, a parent can always challenge at a later stage. So we're quite proud in Northern Ireland that we have been doing this for quite a number of years, um, in the, the rest of the UK, they're now talking about a really new thing called Foster Adopt, and we're saying, we've been doing that for quite a long time, and it's always really nice when you know, something in Ireland is ahead of the rest of uh, the UK. Of course, there are also a, a number of children who are adopted by their existing foster carers. Um, and these are children who, it wasn't really thought perhaps that adoption might be an option at an early stage, but as time has gone, gone on, um, things have probably got um, 
more difficult for their birth family and it becomes evident that they're never going to be able to return home. So some of those children may move to new family for adoption and some of those foster carers will say, we would like to be considered, at which point then they have to be, go through the, you know, the process of being approved as adopters, but they'll be approved for that specific child. There's also, of course, kinship adoption, not a large number, but there's where grandparents perhaps or an aunt or uncle uh, might adopt the child. And of course, step-parent step adoption, which is another whole, a topic for another seminar perhaps. Um, it's the same, I think, in your jurisdiction as in ours, that uh, both parents in step-parent adoption have to apply, so the, the birth parent becomes the adoptive parent. Um, not a good situation. So what's different, I suppose, um, in the other UK countries? Well, eligibility, and that has been a real bar to the legislation moving on in uh, Northern Ireland. We've had draft legislation now, I think, since about 2006 um, to update and amend the uh, 1987 adoption order, but it's still sitting, I'm afraid, up at, up at Stormont. And, and, of course, the, uh, the bit that uh, a lot of our politicians get very anxious about is about the eligibility. So, uh, and as I say, Fergus will talk a bit more about that. So, in other UK countries, cohabiting heterosexual couples or same-sex couples can jointly adopt, whether or not they're in civil partnerships. And in step-parent adoption, the new partner is the sole adopter. So, in fact, step-parent adoption is now usually called partner adoption in the other UK countries. Um, ethnicity and race. Any of you who've followed the debate in some of the English papers, uh, this has been a real um, campaign of uh, Martineri and the current uh, coalition government um, because uh, black and minority ethnic children wait longer to be adopted and there is a move to say that uh, you shouldn't allow that child to wait and wait for someone of exactly the same ethnicity. I think social workers would argue they have never really done that. that, uh, that clearly you need someone who can, who can um, assist the child grow up um, to be proud of their heritage and to understand and accept their race and ethnicity but I think there's a, there's a, a bit of um, bad publicity that is undeserved there uh, to some degree uh, the, and that's still kind of being debated really in how the, how the legislation may change around that. Um, in the other UK countries as I mentioned they have a shortage of approved adopters um, so again they're rather envious of us and uh, making um, little uh, forays into trying to snaffle some of the adopters from Northern Ireland and there are occasionally there are children who are placed um, from the other UK countries, but it isn't uh, very common, and, and one of the reasons is that often there will be ongoing contact. So the shortage and the ethnicity arguments have really focused the, the coalition government on trying to speed up the adoption process, and I'm heartened that you're actually slightly slowing it down, because I think there's that risk that speeding it up too quickly is, is not going to serve either children or, or adopters well, particularly bearing in mind the, the aspects of, of the children who are harder to place, you know, children with that uncertainty about their developmental delay and so on. So I think children need to be placed early, but I think we need to be very rigorous about how we assess and approve uh, the people who are going to offer them that family to make sure it is a, really a forever family. So, how do we get all these adopters? How come we're so fortunate to have so many? Well, we now have a regional adoption and fostering service in Northern Ireland, so that has been enormously helpful. So rather than each of the five um, health and social care trusts doing their own thing, if you like, in terms of trying to, to bring forward interest in fostering and adoption, there's, there's one team who do that for the whole of, of the North of Ireland. And, and we're so small that, that that's perfectly manageable and they can do it very professionally and very well. The trusts and the voluntary adoption agencies hold information evenings. Um, we had a, an open afternoon at Bath um, at the end of National Adoption Week and I think we had over 60 people came along which was wonderful 
um, except that we only had 30 chairs and 30 cups of tea and coffee. So lots of people are very interested, which is wonderful. Um, we get lots of inquiries as well, I would have to say, from the south of people who, now that you have ratified Hague, um, thinking that you know they'll be able to easily adopt from, from the north of Ireland in particular. And um, it, it may happen at some point, but it's not straightforward, I think. There's also targeted recruitment because we know now a lot about those children who wait longer. So the idea being that, you know, could you adopt an older child? Have you ever thought about um, a child um, uh, with a disability? Sometimes ads are placed uh, looking for uh, placements for specific children. Um, there's a not allowed to use photographs. Uh, for obvious reasons, um, but uh, and usually they will give a, a slight amendment of the child's name, although you've got to be a bit careful about that because uh, some research discovered that actually if you give people another name and say, oh, you know, there's this little boy and he's called Jack, for example, and he turns out to be called James or John, there's something that in their heads they had this Jack child that they were thinking they might be interested in. It's very, very um, interesting, really. And uh, sometimes it might be a name that's significant to them, but we're, we're wary of, of changing children's names too much. I suppose the other thing that's been different and that uh, the, the uh, regional service website and ourselves and, and everyone who can, trying to promote positive messages about um, adopting older children. And of course that means that the people who may think about adopting them are different people as well. They may be older, they may be people who have birth children, um, they may be people who are in a second marriage and maybe one of them has raised children and they, are, they haven't raised children together. So, so the adopters need to be different um, to, to meet the needs of the children. So when you've got your child who is going to be adopted and... Um, you've got your adopters, so how does it all work? How are they all linked together? So usually most children are placed within their local trust pool of adopters. So out of the 56, 54 children who were placed in that particular year, I think a handful of those, maybe five or six, and that would have been the first year of operation of our register, uh, would have been placed through that. So most children, um, they come into care within the trust area. The trust has their pool of adopters and they have a meeting to think about who might be the best family for, for this particular child or children. We also have two voluntary adoption agencies, Family Care Society and Adoption Roots, um, and they also um, assess, approve and uh, have available adopters. I talked before about ARIS, the Regional Information System. Um, it just seemed crazy, you know, that a child in Derry could maybe have been matched with a family in Newry, but nobody actually made that link. People might have made telephone calls to say, oh, do you have anyone? And they said, oh, we're not going to give you our people because we want to hang on to them. So that has really made a big difference. It's been challenging for trusts to work across and outside of their boundaries, but it has resulted now in, I think, the last count... There were about 20 children who have been placed uh, directly as a result of that. Um, and some quite imaginative placements as well of siblings who couldn't be placed together but were placed in a cluster with three different families who adopted two each in a, in a small uh, rural area. So, so lots of exciting things happening. If I had more time, I'd talk more about adoption exchange days and activity days, adoption parties. These are all new ways of trying to find families for children where um, uh, either information about children or uh, the actual children are actually there at an event and adopters who are approved to adopt can come along. Quite, um, well, you think controversial? They've done this in America for a very long time, and there's, uh, Bath has been involved in getting these going again, with a, with a lot of success, actually, um, in, in the UK. And those last two points there are online publications um, that people can sign into and have a look at children who wait. Um, I won't go through all of this because I don't want to take up too much of my time. You have the slides anyway, but essentially there are regional policy and procedures, and that's the process. 
Most children adopted in Northern Ireland will continue to have contact access, I think you mostly still call it here, with members of their birth family. It might be occasional or it might be more frequent and it could be any of those with any of those people um, who are listed there. So that's a big change and that has been a huge challenge to practice to find people who are open to that, to open adoption. Adoptions are very rarely completely closed and secret because if you've got a child who's four and a half, they know that they didn't always live with this family. Um, so, so that has been uh, very challenging, but we've got there, we think, now. So most adopters are open to that. In fact, all, I think. So what are the challenges, really, to practice in Northern Ireland? I spoke before the mismatch between the expectations and capacity of adopters and the needs of children requiring adoption. And I think the out-of-date legislation, but also the lack of robust post-adoption support. It's no longer any good to say, here you are, Here's, you're a forever family now, please go and live happily ever after. These are challenging children with challenging behaviours. We have delay in our courts, and I know that you do too, um, and, and an increasing focus on getting children placed with relatives, which can delay things as well. So finally... The way forward, what I suggest is that you look and consider about lessons from the UK regarding good practice. There is a lot of research out there and some of it may be helpful. I guess if there's one key message to take away from, from this presentation, it's about early care planning for the best permanence option for this child. What does this child need? What's the best way of achieving that? I think the thorough information and preparation and flexible and accessible post-adoption support. Those are easy to say, they're hard to put into practice. Finally, just to say, a little plug, I promised Thomas I would do this. Um, I do some training in, in linking in with BESPRA, and some of you will have got flyers for two uh, workshops next month on preparing the adopters and preparing children for adoption. And also some of you will have a mention of, we're putting on a conference in Belfast, um, on the 12th of March about family finding, uh, particularly focusing at the, on those harder to, to place children. My email address is on the back of the presentation, so if you want to get in touch with me, I'd really like to hear from you. Thank you very much.